Thanks a lot, Suvrat, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I really look forward to talking to you guys about these uh, ideas. Um, so these lectures will focus on a recent, recent set of, uh, I think, significant updates on the information paradox, um, which, which were made possible, I think, because of two factors. Uh, the first being insights gathered from holography, namely computing entropy um, holographically, the holographic entropy of Ryu Takanagi and Engelhardt Wall and so on and so forth, which I'll review at some point. And the second uh, comes from identifying um, a class of solvable models, uh, that, those being SYK and JT gravity, which uh, might seem deficient in some ways, um, but uh, the thing that I hope to argue is that they, st they still retain uh, very surprising features which are actually expected in more realistic systems coming from higher dimensions. Um, the goal of this first lecture is to introduce the problem, namely the information paradox, uh, which I aim to do entirely in, in, in the language of uh, the, model, the model I'm going to consider, which is JT gravity. And the goal is to confuse you as much as possible. That's, that's the first lecture. And then uh, I'll resolve things as I go on. Uh, so let me begin by reviewing the model. Actually, before that, um, jump in at any point, ask questions and so on. Um, OK, so let me begin by reviewing the model. So I'm going to consider JT gravity. It's a, it's a 1 plus 1 dimensional gravitational theory, which, with, which has a dilaton uh, phi and a metric g. Um, I'm going to couple it to some matter that's going to be a conformal field theory uh, on the background metric G. So the conformal field theory does not couple to the dilaton. Um, and uh, so often when I say CFT, people confuse this with the sort of possible boundary CFT living on the, on the boundary of ADS2. That's different. This is a bulk matter system. Let's focus first on the gravitational sector, that's, uh, which is JT gravity, that's, couple, that's given by this action. Um, it has a dilaton phi, it has phi naught, which is just a constant, which is gonna be responsible for the ground, the ground state entropy, but I'm going to ignore phi naught for the most part. Um, and there's a Ricci scalar term and a cosmological constant term, and also a boundary term. In solving this theory, one needs to impose boundary conditions. Um, this, is, this is what we do usually in ADS-CFT. We say, for example, that the metric near the boundary goes as 1 over epsilon squared or 1 over z squared, so it's asymptotically ADS. And this is the GUU component, where U should, should be thought of as the boundary proper time. And we also need to impose conditions on the dilaton. So the statement is that the dilaton also goes as 1 over epsilon, um, so it goes to this value phi b, and phi b is some constant phi r divided by epsilon. So the, all of this is in the limit as epsilon goes to zero, and I should have said epsilon is like the holographic direction orthogonal to the boundary. So it's, it's like the z coordinate um, in Poincare coordinates. Um, to solve this theory, uh, um, one convenient thing to do is to integrate uh, out the dilaton. Um, so if you look at this term here, if you integrate over phi over a complex contour, or, or rather an imaginary contour, that, uh, this will localize the metric to be ADS2. It's going to be a delta function of r plus 2, so r has to be minus 2. And therefore, the metric is going to be given by, uh, it's, it's going to be given by hyperbolic space. So here I wrote ADS2. Um, this is, um, it's simplest to work in Poincaré coordinates. So we write down the metric in this way, um, which we can also choose to work in light cone coordinates in terms of t plus and minus z. So you have this uh, nice metric. And from, um, let me see. OK, so here we have some time coordinate t. Um, but the, um, um, this t here is different from the proper time u. The relation between the, um, the, the proper time, the, the boundary proper time u and the Poincaré time t 
depends on the possible shape of the boundary. Okay? So here we have a solution which is ADS2, uh, point carry ADS2, which is just this wedge there. The location of the boundary is going to be some trajectory like this. And you pin down the location of the boundary by using this boundary condition. Um, this guy. And this thing to arrive at the following, following equation. Um, from this, one deduces that there's a relation between z as a function of u and t as a function of u. You'll find that z is equal to epsilon, the same epsilon there, times t prime of u. Where the, so here we parameterize the location of the boundary as some t of u comma z of u. And um, so we see that the shape of the boundary uh, is entirely set by the, what, what I will call the reparameterization between t and u. So given t of u, you can find uh, z of u. And um, this uh, reparameterization is actually the only dynamical degree of freedom in JT gravity. And it, uh, the dynamics of this mode comes entirely from this boundary term, because remember, we localized things to uh, hyperbolic space, so this term is not there anymore. And plugging in this uh, formula into k, one ends up with uh, this expression. So this is how you derive the Schwarzian action. That's what this thing is called. Um, one can also get, so, so here, in some sense, the, the um, so we didn't talk much about what happens deep in the bulk, right? In principle, that's all captured by this, but sometimes it's nicer to write down the equations for what happens deep in the bulk, and you can get that by, by uh, varying with respect to the metric and getting Einstein's equations. So one obtains a uh, equation of this form, um, some differential operator acting on, on phi, the dilaton, you find it to be sourced by the CFT stress tensor. Now, the CFT is a, is a fully quantum mechanical thing. And so we choose to work in the so-called semi-classical limit, where we source, where, where the thing that we put here is not an operator, but rather the expectation value of the stress tensor. So that, that's how you should think of this, this equation. We're in some sense working in the so-called Semi-classical limit. Uh, yeah, well, when you find solutions for this equation, they will be specified up to boundary conditions, and those, those boundary conditions will fix the fix the solution. Okay. Yes. I'm trying to understand whether your, your, you know, whether the, the statement is that in the exact theory you work with the full action, uh -huh. which is the CFT coupling. Yes, yes. But you're going to use a semi classical approximation for that. Yes. In yes. principle, the theory is defined by different parts of the people who work. Exactly. 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 Um, in fact, Well, I mean, this thing follows, I mean, this thing follows because we're, work, we're working about some saddle points. And those are the saddle point equations. And so the claim is that if you're, if the set of questions that you're asking, well, depending on the question you ask, different saddles might contribute. And the statement is that, uh, is that, um, No, no, but, but it really depends on the question. And, and, and ultimately, we'll, we'll, we'll find that there are, other, there are some questions which are important for us where this naive saddle point is not, not the correct one. Okay? But for now, the set of questions I'm going to address the, the, for this talk 
is going to be the one where this saddle point is really the leading one, and this is, this is an accurate uh, equation. Good. I'm going to work, I'm going to consider the vacuum solution. Okay. So this thing is zero. And the claim is that the solutions you have in this case are actually eternal black holes. Um, I'll explain. Metric. Yes. Now, uh, you're saying that you're setting that to zero. Yes. I'm just considering vacuum equations. I'm putting them in by hand. So this is zero, and you find this solution for the dilaton. Looks a bit complicated, but uh, I'll express it in a simpler way in a second. From the boundary condition that phi goes to phi r <coughs> over epsilon, one finds the following reparameterization between t and u. So it's just tan hyperbolic. So the picture you get is something like this. So the location of the boundary particle starts at some point here or some point here and goes all the way up and ends at a point there. Along this, along the boundary, the proper time goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. At when u goes to minus infinity from this equation, you find that t goes to some minus one over pi t. And when it goes to plus infinity, it goes as one over pi t. And um, the, so the point is that, uh, okay, hand wavy argument, but it's, but it's correct. If you, because we're, we're only looking at, at a patch, um, that's, that, that's sort of, we're, yeah, we're looking at a finite patch with a full point gray patch. That's the thing that gives you a temperature. This, uh, the, 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 yeah, this 10 hyperbolic in Euclidean space gives you, uh, it's periodic with, with periodicity uh, given by one over T. Okay, so, so this, so this uh, theory has a non-contractible cycle, uh, at least from the boundary perspective, um, and um, therefore it's a finite temperature state. And therefore the correct interpretation is that it's an eternal black hole in this way. And in fact, if you, if you work uh, to, to, to justify that interpretation more, one can choose to work in what I call black hole exterior coordinates where you write down x plus minus as, uh, as again, tan hyperbolic of y plus minus, where y plus minus, the, where the time coordinate in the y is u, and then there's some radial coordinate sigma. Okay? In these coordinates, the dilaton gets this form. It is static, it only depends on sigma. And so lines of constant dilaton look something like this. which is the usual thing that you have for an eternal black hole. You have lines of constant r, the Schwarzschild radial coordinate. They look something like this. Phi is like r. Right? So really, these are, this, is an eter this is an eternal black hole. And uh, if you ask me where the singularity is, um, some people draw it here. This is the location uh, uh, where the dilaton goes to minus infinity. Okay. Sometimes I'm going to draw the singularity like this just because it's more familiar, but really ultimately it doesn't matter. There's an inner, there's an inner horizon. That's right. There's actually, what actually happens is you have something like this. There's an inner horizon and then you connect to the other asymptotic uh, region and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah. That's right, that's right. I, I, and I will not need to do that. I will confuse you without going there. Um, okay, so that's the model. Any, qu any questions about this? Okay, um, let me see. Okay, we're not gonna need this anymore. So, um, the kind of black hole that I wanna consider is, is still an eternal black hole, but one that is coupled to two 
external flat space CFDs. Let me explain. So we imagine that we have that black hole. Um, Um, so the exact same solution as I considered there over here, but I want to consider adding two CFTs, which I'm going to call BR and BL, um, which are defined, so these are uh, flat space CFTs uh, on the metric okay. uh, on the flat metric given by that dy plus dy minus. Here you should think of what I'm doing is that I'm still imposing the same Dirichlet condition on the metric, so still ADS2 and so on and so forth here, but I'm turning on absorbing boundary uh, sorry transparent boundary conditions on the stress tensor. Okay. So if I have some radiation or some, some, um, yeah, some radiation or, or whatever, some non-zero stress tensor in this region, it will propagate f freely to, the, to this asymptotically flat CFT or, the, or to this flat space CFT. And similarly, if I have some, some stress tensor here, it'll just fall in. Okay, good. So, so uh, what do I mean by the statement that things uh, flow out? Yes, okay. Very good, very good, very good. So, okay. um, I mean the following thing. Let me erase this. In the ADS2 region, I had the stress tensor T x plus minus x plus minus equal to zero when defined with respect to the background metric ds squared um, equals minus four dx plus dx minus over x plus minus x minus squared. And um, the, 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 the implication of the transparent boundary conditions, or I guess a way of defining them, is to say that this stress tensor over here fully determines the stress tensor here and here. Okay? And, it, and it, uh, it determines it entirely using the um, conformal anomaly. So there's the equation for the conformal anomaly, which is that the... Um, dy plus dx uh, plus times d, uh, sorry, yeah. this thing squared, ty plus y plus, so let's look at just plus for now. This thing is equal to t um, x plus x plus, uh, I forget if this is a plus or minus, c over 12, x plus y plus, okay? So the, the statement is that the stress tensor in, um, um, in terms of the y coordinates, ah, sorry, sorry, uh, there, there's one point that I forgot to mention. There's one, for, uh, one, one important point I forgot to mention. You could, have, you could have said, why did we, why did we put uh, or define a flat metric with respect to y plus and minus? Well, we're trying to join it with the exterior of the black hole. The y plus minus coordinates, they cover this entire, so in defining over there, the y plus minus coordinates cover this entire region, and they are naturally extended to this part. Okay? Um, and so now the statement is that um, uh, it is this transformation rule that will tell you what the stress tensor in the y plus y plus and the y plus y minus coordinate is everywhere inside this diamond. Um, 
That's right. I, I, I will talk about that soon. The coupling here is for all time. I know. Let's you turn on transparent modification. At some point, okay? Uh, I would imagine that sometime later, if things would make sense, there would be information from the right side propagating to that side. So they I mix in this sense. Well, no, but there would also be something from here would go and affect the digital and then, then propagate back. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I'm confused about how you have gravity in half the space and don't have gravity. Um, I, as I said, I will explain that in a second. But but um, I claim that you can that, that you're allowed to do this. You can uh, uh, th this this might be a special thing of one plus one dimensions that you can literally just say gravity turns on at some point. It, it, it's actually two things. It's that we 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 can turn on gravity at some point, and we say that it's asymptotically ADS because we know that the metric is fixed in this region because it, it goes as ADS two. But 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 in a, in a few minutes I'll talk about this more. But uh, please, Manta. If I see the parking angle that you had in the description, you had an action for the electron and the metric, and then for the metric and the CFT. The CFT. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, if I integrate up the electron, as you said, I am localizing always on R plus V equal to zero. Mm -hmm. This is why I am a yeah. Okay, maybe it's the same question. Though. So this part integral that you wrote is not really valid for the full time? Uh, so good. So you should imagine that there's another term. So, um, so there was IJT, and there was ICFT. Uh, this was on G. But then there's also ICFT on the flat metric. Okay. Uh, you can think of these two things as, as really the same, as the same uh, well, uh, let me see. Yeah, but remember, we're localizing this to ADS2. So this is really now, so, so this is really just a ICFT on ADS2. You mean this thing? Um, no, that's 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 different. That's that's here. What you are saying is the conformal conformal matter also interacts with this uh, evaluation mode. Right? Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it does in a very simple way. Just just in what the value, what the stress tensor is. Mm -hmm. And the right CFT is defined in the left of it, to the right of the straight line. Um, no, you need, you need to. Um, the right CFT is defined to the right of the wiggly line. But now that the wiggly line degree of freedom would be. No, let's. let's Which is around the period. Um, okay, here, here's a possible cheat. Um, that so I'm actually not sh um, I don't have a precise statement about where one is defined and where the other so where where one ends and the other begins I suspect it, it might not make a difference um, simply because we're really working the epsilon goes to zero limit right so this thing goes really goes all the way to this boundary. Yeah. The, the, Taking epsilon, taking epsilon to z taking the limit epsilon goes to zero does not does not uh, does, doesn't go against that. I mean, there's still boundary wiggles. And and so, um, how about this? Let's say. That, that the place where this ends and this starts 
is really the asymptotic boundary. So let's think of it like that. Um, the way that, that the, the boundary wiggles responds to the CFT is by responding to the stress tensor. Okay. Let me say now that, um, just another comment, that this, this ICFT on the background metric G on ADS2 can actually be written, so, so, so this is um, on the bath, and this is on ADS2, or I'm gonna say on bulk. By bulk and bath, I mean this region and the, and the complementary region. This thing can actually be written as, as a CFT path integral or um, action on flat space, just using the usual, usual conformal anomaly business. So then we have some contribution from the conformal anomaly plus I CFT also on flat space. And there's JT as well. I'm just writing this thing in terms of these guys. That's all I was doing. And now this guy plus this guy is just a usual CFT uh, action on the, on the space that starts here and ends somewhere in the, uh, at the end of the path. That's right. And you can ask, let's say you put a uh, uh, matter inside the bulk, and you put, put an operator on the right hand side, and your other scene. That's the, that's, you can answer the question. At the level at which we were, were talking up to now, the commute. So, uh, why? Sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a I mean, right now we just have some, some, uh, some, some local quantum field theory plus some mode that's living here. Uh, so the things here will the, will definitely the, commute there. I still don't, I don't understand the the, the non commutativity statement. So, so Because of the constraints, I agree. Yes. They commute. But because the metric here is fixed, there's no there's no gravitational dressing in this region. The JT, I should have said, the JT is only defined on the bulk. The bulk region, which is which is inside here. The thing is, at some point, you would be able to write an operator on the boundary in terms of the integrated product of operators on the right hand side. So, have a, a, a control operator that gets you know goes is not zero, and then suddenly it's becomes zero at some point. Sorry. This one? So no, that, that, that that's fixed. Yes. So the first one you keep fixed to the left circle. Sorry, the first one? Yeah, the, the, the circle you have to the left is the bulk. Yeah, so that's why it's fixed. Let's keep the, the one as three fixed. Like Perfect. It. Now let's take two and let's move it uh, from in, in the bulk, where it has a non-zero commutator. Let's move it gradually into the other side. So but, I, but I thought two was the, 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 like the, the reparameterization mode yeah, or something. But at some point I could take two to be some other bulk operator as well. OK, fine. Yes. And the claim is that the commutator has some kind of step function behavior or something. If it's not zero, and then suddenly it drops to zero. Yes. And I'm worried about, I don't know, just continue. Um, I'm worried about when there's many things that I'm worried about. Right? You know, I don't, I, no, I, I, I don't see why that's a problem. You just look at the two-point function. There's an imaginary part, which is the same thing. It's not zero imaginary part, and at some point it just drops to zero. No, but remember, I mean, I mean, this is this is this is not your average two-point function. I mean, here you have to it's, it's gravitationally dressed and so on and so forth. So, so that operator doesn't. It's not something that you can actually literally move from here to here. This uh, this operator here, I have some phi whatever uh, dressed dressed to gravity. The, the operator phi here is not an extension of this phi, because this phi is composed of some matter degrees of freedom and gravitons. 
This phi is just matter degrees, just matter degrees of freedom. Same matter. Same matter. But 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 it's not it's not it's not the same operator that you had here. Yeah. This thing had gravitons. This does not have gravitons. So I wouldn't so I wouldn't say that. Uh, Sure. Yeah, but it's a weird definition. So that's why you have this this continuity. Not necessarily. Well, we need we, to fully address this question. One first needs to define the operator and uh, and, and 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 check how it behaves. Um, it's not clear to me that that's a, a real killer for this. Can I, yes? This is a question about classical So this system that you define, does it define a, you know, like a genuine classical system with a series and a simple One thing that one might worry about Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have not checked that. Um, I suspect it's well defined. I mean, just simply because I simply because I can define the way that I've defined it just now, and I can solve for equations of motion and everything and so forth, and I never run into issues. <laughs> That's what I suspect, yes. Simply because I can solve it and, uh, and I get reasonable answers. Um, I can make comments about this later, but uh, for now, let me say the simplicity of this is because of one plus one dimensions. It's because you don't have gravitons. Yes, but that's still that's, that's no, but that's no, but you don't have propagating gravitons. I mean, if you have propagating gravitons, then you say, what does it mean to have the transparent boundary conditions? Because gravitons are going to go through. Um, but but there is a way to freeze them, which I'll I'll discuss later. Yeah. Oh no, this is the. Uh, I just came from Mumbai, okay? It was. <laughs> okay. We also don't get very hungry very quickly. So. Okay. So, in a sense, uh, if you look at the theory without the conformity of theory added, then uh, the way to define it is in terms of this cutoff, actually. That's right. So suppose we just uh, have this cutoff and you put t equal to u, then uh, that's the. Point curry solution. Yes, that's just the line. And uh, the uh, conformal transformation simply wiggles the. Uh -huh. the, this boundary. Uh -huh. Now, I, I guess the point is that let's jo let's join the whole thing before doing the reparameterization. So we have a simple situation that you have this ABS string wedge, and uh, you know with a cutoff, and on this side you have flat space right? So That's right. You can arrange such a box like this. Actually. That's right. And then make a large conformal transformation so that this conformity theory, degrees of freedom, also interact with the gravity. Yeah, yeah. Theory, right? yeah, yeah. Isn't so, that, that what's going on? That's, uh, it's very similar to what's going on. Let me, let, me, let me sort of summarize what you just said. So one can consider the situation where you have, um, so like an extreme, oh, sorry, an extremal black hole. The cutoff surface looks something like this with four finite epsilon. But if you take epsilon to zero, it simply goes all the way to this vertical line. Now one can, so now, now this idea of where to patch things is very simple. Um, you just, uh, you patch along the z equals zero line. So now we have a flat space CFD here and a ADS2 here. Um, and uh, uh, so in this case, x plus is equal to, or x plus minus is equal to y plus minus. Remember, they were related by a tan, a tan hyperbolic. But if you take t to zero, you get this. Um, and so you can study this system uh, dynamically. 
uh, by that I mean you can first insert some stress energy. And then, so what happens is exactly what you expect. Uh, by keeping track of how the stress tensor here is related to the stress tensor here, how, uh, how it's affected due to this mode, to this uh, excitation, that stress tensor, st stress tensor back reacts on the, on the boundary particle, on the reparameterization, and you find that it ends at a sooner point, uh, sort of an earlier point, not all the way there, and you end up with a horizon. Really, it, everything worked exactly how you expect. And so this is, a, this is not quite like that system, but it, um, it, uh, it, it, at least at late times, it looks um, arbitrarily close to it. What would really clarify this whole issue is that we know the boundary conditions of an electric and the electron on this mm -hmm. the right hand side. Mm -hmm. So they're transparent boundary conditions. What does that mean? So there are no boundary conditions. Uh, Neumann. 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 How about that? Let's just think of it like that. Neumann. It's, it's not really a boundary. Things just float through. There is no contradiction that on the left hand side the field actually interacted with the gravity, and on the right hand side there is no gravity. There is no. No contradiction. Conflict. No. I don't know this, but I mean, I'm asking you. There, 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 there is no conflict, um, um, and you can see that somehow by. Um, uh, um, energy is conserved. How about that? But, but so far, so far, we're doing classical theory. So far, let's let's discuss the classical problem. We'll we'll we can talk about commutator issues later. I'm just I'm just solving these semi-classical equations. I'm, I'm, I'm imposing Dirichlet conditions on the metric for all time. Well, you know, uh, in, in now in this situation where you have transparent boundary conditions, you have one Cauchy surface that goes from maybe three to one across the diagonal. You some conditions on that Cauchy surface. I'm, I'm, I'm defining the gravity theory with Dirichlet conditions for all time. But, so that, that's in the layer because you had ADS. Yes. So apart from the Cauchy slice, you also had to give me boundary conditions. Yes. But I'm I'm not I'm not putting uh, the, so on this side the only boundary conditions are Neumann conditions on 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 the CFT. Sorry, let me see. Okay, okay. So, I mean, so Einstein's equations have this property, it's just not clear. Yeah. And you do this coupling, then you will have to do an evolution of this. Then you can compute the Um. I think I might be able to make a few more comments on this in a few, in a, uh, after a few points I make. Um. <coughs> yes. So, I'm just like, you think it's Einstein that you're talking here? So, Yes. Ah, good. No, good, good. So, um, okay. What happens with the flat space? So, you, so the, the patching between, this might actually be related. The patching between the bulk and the, and the bath, I'm going to call this a bath, uh, is actually dynamical. It's actually, it's actually dictated by the location of the boundary particle. So in this case, um, what actually happens is that you get something like this. The uh, future times, the asymptotic infinity of the bath 
uh, sort of matches this point. Yeah, yeah. That's how it works. Um, okay, but it turns out, I mean, in my case, I'm never gonna consider dynamics. I'm just gonna consider that black hole. Um, okay, so. Doesn't that mean that the sky plus at least is dynamic? Like doing something in the sky plus? Um, in this sense, yes. There's a sign language you're putting dynamics on the last baseball. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's really just, it's, uh, this, the, this picture is, is really just the dynamics of the boundary particle. No, no, but this is because of gravity on this side, not because of gravity on that side. Right, right. So, so, so the gravity on this side is T of U. It's dictated by this function, and the the this tells you that the U goes to infinity of the bath must patch at the T of U. Uh, um, uh, a t of infinity, right? Which is this point here. So when it was when it was zero temperature, this t, a t of u was equal to u. So then the infinity patches there. But now you have this other solution where t of infinity is is finite from that equation, and so it tells you you have to end there. Um, so it's it, really this is gravity in the bulk. Yeah, exactly, for the derivative vanishes. Um, okay. So from, from, let me just make a comment here first. So here, from, the, from this equation, the fact that you have vacuum, um, I think I have this equation a bit off, but uh, whatever. From, from, from this equation, one finds yeah, this is actually, I think, y plus x plus. One finds that uh, t y plus y plus, and similarly for minus minus, is equal to something like c over 12 x plus y plus, which is equal to c over uh, minus, actually. Um, Okay, let me change convention. This is actually minus 24 pi. Uh, pi uh, minus 24 pi. This is the right convention uh, for how stress tensor is defined in gravity. 12 pi times t squared. So the stress tensor in the bath is some constant controlled by the temperature. So this tells you that this system that we have um, from the, for an observer sort of floating in the path region, they see some constant energy flux coming in and going out. So there's flux doing this and that, and this and doing that. Um, this is just Hawking radiation, okay? It's a result of the conformal anomaly in one plus one dimensions. Um, um, all this is in this entire diamond diagram. Not only in the place where you join the space tanks, but also. Yeah. So this this is so this is this is the stress tensor in the y coordinates. So this would be observed by for an observer in the bath, or even if they're in the bulk, yeah. but provided that they you know follow sort of a constant sigma. A surface or constant R surface. Okay. This, this, is, this is just the usual thing of the uh, Rindler radiation and the Unruh effect and so on. Um, okay, now something that will be important uh, for us is the nature of the global state defined uh, on the space time. Right? The state on like a slice there, the quantum state of the, of the fields. And um, 
I claim that uh, first one defines, uh, before I make the claim, one defines a coordinate w plus minus. This coordinate covers the entire diamond um, diamond like this, which is like, is like this thing. I'm just extending these guys up and down. Plus minus. I claim that the state that we have is the vacuum on this entire diamond defined with respect to some metric uh, dw plus dw minus. Um, sorry, this is actually less of a claim and more of a definition. I'm defining some coordinate w which covers this entire diamond such that it's the vacuum with respect to this coordinate. Um, now, the, this, the, 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 we want to relate this to the stress tensors that we have here. Um, in particular, we want to reproduce this, this fact, that in the x plus minus coordinate, the stress tensor is zero. This tells you that um, the coordinate transformation between w plus minus and x plus minus has to be an SL2 transformation. Because the stress tensor in X is related to that of W via the conformal anomaly. And uh, so, so it's some transformation. I, I'll, I'll write it down schematically. It looks something like this. Uh, um, and the uh, and the transformation between W and Y is you just need to plug in for these X's tan hyperbolic. And so, in fact, you'll end up finding that W goes as something like exponential of Y. And there's a temperature somewhere in there. Um, so the statement is that we, the, the, the CFT state on this space-time is just, uh, we, we found a coordinate where the CFT state is the vacuum. And we can, uh, we can uh, starting from this, we can find the stress tensor in, in, with respect to the y coordinate just by doing a transformation to y, or the stress tensor in the bulk by doing a coordinate transformation to x. Okay. Um, Uh, yes. No, no, not, it's not, so it's just the equation space. The expectation value. Okay. Um, I want to think of this, so, so. How does the fine dilaton? How does the? Fine dilaton. So there's no dilaton here. I'm just talking about the state of the quantum fields. Yeah, I mean, yes, there is. I mean, there, there is a background gravity solution, but um, but um, um, let me see. So, if you recall, the the CFT stress tensor only coupled to the metric. I believe that's the only relevant thing here in defining the state of the of the field theory. Ultimately, this is not a well-defined thing. Ultimately, this is not a well-defined thing if you, if you allow gravity to fluctuate. But for now, I'm doing quantum field theory on a fixed background. Then I claim this is a well-defined thing. Here, I've defined, so remember, I'm defining the W coordinate in this way. It, it is, um, so, it, it's still, it, so, 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 okay. 
Oh, maybe, maybe, okay, so. Um, okay, something that I skipped, uh, glossed over actually. The, so we want, um, good, 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 good. So this thing needs to go to, needs to reproduce the fact that the stress tensor in the x-coordinate is zero on the metric, which is ADS2, right? Um, when I do this, it's not enough to just, it's not, the coordinate transformation is not enough. You need to do a diffeomorphism plus a vial transformation, right? To go from here to the ADS2 metric. And uh, there might be a contribution from that vial transformation, which is the thing that gives you the, the ADS2 warp factor. But in this case, the warp factor is so simple, it actually does not generate a, an anomaly contribution. Um, No, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to define a W coordinate. Okay, I'm, I'm starting with W coordinate being being the vacuum with respect to this metric and so on. And now, um, but part of the, defining the the W coordinate is to find the relation between that W and X and Y and so on. So I need to reproduce this fact. No. Um, because I'm doing a valid transformation. Yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. So, good. So, so schematic, okay, this is extremely schematic. So, I we'll have JT plus I CFT on metric G plus I CFT on eta. I've done a vial transformation here to write this as some um, conformal anomaly plus I CFT on eta. Those two give you the, the sort of dilaton equations of motion and so on. And these two things defi define for you some vacuum state on a flat metric. That's how you should think about it. Exactly. But, but, no, but, 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 but again, I'm doing this about some solution. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not solving this thing, uh, I'm not solving the entire thing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm expanding about some saddle, the saddle being where uh, the solution of this thing is just ADS2 plus a dilaton of some, some form. Not yet, not yet. So far, right now, I just, I agree that that's an important thing, ultimately. But for now, I just want to, um, working, working in this limit where the gravity is fixed, I want to make statements about, about what the quantum state is of the quantum fields. Okay. And the um, thing that I wanted to get to was, um, sort of uh, related to what I just said, you can think of this, the, the, the claim that I'm making in that I can find a coordinate uh, W where it's just a vacuum on flat space is a statement that the, that the, um, the path integral on the fixed background metric of ADS2 is equivalent to this path integral on, on, on this flat background. That's, that's what I was saying here essentially. Um, let, me, let me see that a bit more precisely. The path integral that defines for us the state on the background, on the, 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 the black hole background, is something that looks like this. Um, told you I'm going to draw the thing that I did like that. Here you have flat space, uh, CFT. And here you have JT, 
Uh, sorry, not JT, not JT, sorry, ADS2. Uh, J, uh, CFT. Okay. So this is the path integral that defines for us as the, the state uh, at t equals zero. And this claim of, of being able to work with these W coordinates is the claim that this is identical, this prepares the same state as the path integral, which is flat space everywhere. Um, w. Okay. Yeah, 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 so everything here is Euclidean. The reason why it looks like, uh, I mean, there's no boundary here. This thing goes all the way to infinity. It's just because I brought these, uh, I brought the spatial infinities to some finite point. But really, this is just a half space um, Euclidean uh, path integral. And really the statement is because I can do a vial transformation and remove this ADS2 factor, the CFT path angle doesn't really care about it uh, in this case. And really I have to stress that this is only true because we're doing this hardle hawking like procedure where we're fixing the background and we're just path integrating the field theory on this, on this fixed background. If, you, if, the, if, if you're integrating over gravity, this is nonsense. Um, so now this is nice. Why? Because this tells you that you just have the Minkowski vacuum in this coordinate w. And um, now th th writing this Minkowski vacuum um, gives us a nice interpretation of the Hawking radiation, simply as Rindler radiation. So the idea is that the thing that we have, um, I'll go here. This vacuum state can be decomposed in terms of Rinder eigenstates. So we have, you know, these modes here and here that are entangled, and they just propagate in this way, let's say. And you have, you know, these entangled pairs across the horizon. And similarly here, the more precise statement is that the omega vacuum or the W vacuum can be written as the thermal field double state with respect to the Y Hamiltonian, which is simply the boost generator in this case. Okay. Where if you, you know, if you have a free theory, you can write this as, uh, so you can do a mode decomposition. And so this is gonna look like Something like that. Just to say, this is so far not technical of gravity. This is just quantum field theory. You have to quantum field theory, then there's a standard state. Standard. There's no real Hawking radiation here. Um, no, no, I would say this is Hawking radiation in one plus one dimensions. In, in this model. Quantum, the, the power field theory, degrees of freedom are the Hawking radiation. Yes, yes. This is the, the important to give you the, 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 the level at which I'm doing things uh, until now is the same level at that that Hawking did. So he had this these these quantum fields on a fixed background, and he model and um, he was able to compute the stress tensor, the expectation value of the stress tensor because of that, and the black hole mass decreased. So. On, on the one side, he's analyzing the quantum state of the fields, then computing the expectation value of T, and showing that that makes the black hole decrease, uh, decrease in mass. That's essentially what I'm doing here. What I didn't understand in this uh, thing is the, the Y transformation is a bit out of the blue, because I mean, in some sense, you're relating a flat space back to the uh, flat. Mm -hmm. You are integrating over the path. So let us call the path field P D field. So uh, if we have the path fields, then uh, certainly the conformal transformation, the wild transformation, will act on them. Yes. But it's a CFT, so we know how to how. Oh, I, I only care about how the stress tensor transforms, and we know that it transforms universally. 
the the, 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 the the transmission, not on the Y transmission. I don't know the transmission. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Remember the the thing that we have is um. um let me see. Uh, so this was. Um, so I'm trying to construct a solution in this space time where I have this as something that I want. Okay? And I'm trying to deduce what this means in terms of the stress tensor in the bath. And the answer to that question comes from the conformal anomaly. The reason being is that this is the stress tensor in this background on this metric. Here I have a different metric, which is dy plus y minus. And to deduce the stress tensor there, it is the standard thing to do is to consider the, 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 the conformal anomaly. So you need to transform from this metric to this metric, these coordinates to those coordinates. And the thing that keeps track for you what the stress tensor looks like here is the conformal anomaly. So I, I didn't put it in by hand. It's, it naturally comes out. Like this is the procedure that you need to follow. Yeah, but, but I'm not doing that. I'm not changing. Uh, oh, oh you, you're talking about this? Yes. No, this, this is just a, it's a, just a, it's a mathematical observation. That if you do the path integral on this space time with a, with a fixed ADS2 metric here, it is equivalent to doing a path integral on a flat space CFT everywhere. In this omega coordinates. Um, yeah. Omega space time. The statement here is that this path integral prepares for you the vacuum in the omega space time. Um, yeah. So th this is just a mathematical thing. To show this mathematical statement, you have to do this by a transmission. Correct. And, but when it's also a singular by a transmission, it's, it's continuity, it's not, not a smooth by a transmission. There, there is a way for, to properly define it, and, and it doesn't give you any issues. I mean, the, 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 you, you really only do the valve transformation um, inside this region. But then it switches off, yes, yes. Um, well, it's, it's, it's kind of weird to define. I mean, so how about this? Let me. No, but uh, I mean, uh, I agree there's a potential issue there, but uh, let me see. The, um, so, so we have ds squared, by the way, uh, okay, we have time, um, is, uh, let me see, let me see. So dx plus dy plus, uh, let me get write this as just this thing squared divided by x plus minus x minus dy plus dy minus. So this is what the metric is in the ADS2 region. I just transformed it to y coordinates. I'm only looking at sort of a region here. And it should go to ds squared is equal to minus um, no. But no, but, but by goes to, I, I just mean, uh, yeah, yeah, ultimately, ultimately, you need to relate it to W, but before you do that, um, you can try to, to, to define this. So, sorry, I don't know why it's an arrow. So, this is the metric here. This is the metric here. Okay. Um, you can try to say that this is equal to some some omega. Uh, often we often we write omega as omega minus two. Right? And, and such that the omega here in this region is that, and the omega here is just trivial. Uh, sorry, here is just one. But I don't think this makes sense. Right? Saying, that, saying that the metric is, is simply, um, there's some function omega that, that uh, some value here and some value there. The reason being is, is, is omega diverges at this point. So it's, so it's not really some continuous function that goes from one region to the other. You really need to define this thing independently on the two sides. 
by, by, by doing this, in this, by doing the transformation in this region here, by, by, um, by considering the path angle in this region. Um, let me see. No, no, you can, you can consider, no, you can consider the, the, the path integral on some patch here. And then you find that the integral on this patch is the same as the integral on a patch here with flat space. I, I, so, I don't have a precise, extremely sharp thing about what happens at the interfaces, but patch by patch it works. But I agree that there might be something funny at the interface, but um, yeah, I don't have a precise statement, I guess, about what happens precisely there. Yeah, so if, if, if you literally write this theta as this function, delta, this, uh, delta, uh, the delta function plus a delta function with one, then you get uh, derivatives, um, delta functions and derivative of delta functions at the interface. And it diverges. Exactly. Um, 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 let me see. Okay, maybe this is something I should think about more. Um, let me move on. Um, so, uh, modulo this possible issue. Um, the state, you should, so we, we now understand what the, what the space time looks like, uh, the, the background geometry. We also know what the state is, which is just the vacuum state and the W coordinates. And we know how to decompose this state in terms of, uh, Rindler eigenstates, so we also see the Hawking radiation. Okay, now the setup um, should be thought of um, really a, sort of as a toy model for um, the near horizon limit of charged black holes in higher dimensions, where you do some, where you do uh, a reduction, and and where the, in some sense, the neck region of those geometries. Uh, is sharp, right? So, it's, so you have usually something like this. And in higher dimensions, you have in the near horizon region, you have some ADS2. Some ADS uh, but in our case, in some sense, what we have is something like this. So we have ADS2 up to some point and then patched onto flat space. Um, now, uh, but I mean, I, I, uh, there might be some controlled approximation where this is true, but I don't know what that is. But uh... okay. Um, um, now. Uh, more generally, the, the observations that I'm going to make about this system, I really think are, are actually general and apply for eternal black holes in any so number. You say that DOI has now become DOI. Then you have everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, the, the coming observations, uh, uh, I claim um, are applicable for eternal black holes in any number of dimensions, um, even the standard maximally extended uh, Schwarzschild black hole. And um, let me also uh, say that some of, the, some of these observations were, were already made by Samir Mathur, but they weren't appreciated much. 
uh, for some reason. Um, the claims are the following, that the eternal black hole has a Hawking information paradox, not Maldesena's information paradox, Hawking's information paradox. They have a hayden Preskill protocol. They require complementarity, and they have a firewall paradox. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain all of that. Um, but how am I doing on time? What's the... Uh, Well, I was going to talk about those next four things. Uh, so that's. Uh, no. Um, they're not even good for the first, the first part. Um, well, I mean, I can try. How about that? Okay. Um, Okay, let me see. Uh, here is this. What is this? Um, let me first uh, very, very briefly review the information paradox uh, in, in the usual way that it's phrased. So we have a black hole. The matter that you throw in, and then there's Hawking radiation entangled with the radiation inside. So here the state, you throw in a state, a pure state, uh, psi, that's a state of the matter, M, and it goes to some thermal radiation. The paradox is the, the statement that we go from a pure state to a mixed state. Okay, um, so it seems like it's a process that transforms pure states to mixed states. That's nonsense. Um, the essence of the paradox is captured uh, by plotting what the entropy is as a function of time. Um, the entropy of the radiation is just thermal. It, um, it simply grows and saturates at some large value. So this is S radiation which is something like trace rho log rho of the Hawking radiation coming out. It's a fine-grained entropy of uh, the, the Hawking radiation. Um, there's another notion of entropy, which is the coarse-grained entropy of the black hole. That's simply the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, S Bekenstein-Hawking, and it's, it's equal to the area of the black hole. Uh, divided by 4G Newton, plus corrections, and it simply decreases and goes to zero as the black, as the black hole evaporates away completely. This coarse-grained entropy, uh, this big, sorry, this Bixian Hawking is a coarse-grained entropy, and it's a measure for the size of the dimension of the black hole Hilbert space. It's not the entropy of the same thing. What is the entropy of the black hole that remains together? Correct. Um, but uh, this, um, so th this actually means that the, so when, plot, when looking at these two curves, the information paradox um, th doesn't, it's not just when the black hole evaporates away completely, but it actually kicks in as soon as the fine grained entropy of the radiation exceeds the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the black hole. Why? Because it says that somehow the amount of entanglement between the radiation and the black hole is larger than what the black hole has room for. A system cannot have more entanglement entropy than its coarse grain entropy. Okay? So in some sense, the black hole has been uh, sort of overfilled. Okay? So the, really the information paradox starts at this time. And I claim that the same thing happens to this black hole. Yeah, but okay, we need to show that. I agree you can 
get paradox by not thinking carefully about gravity, but the moment you do, the idea that you have reason outside it is entangled with reason inside that that just goes. Um uh I agree that that's gonna be the answer, but uh my position is that I'm not sure um um I will give a sharp realization of that. And I'm, I'm not sure I uh, completely understand the other proposals that are out there. Maybe, you're, maybe you've, you've had some proposals that maybe you can talk, talk to me about later. No, that, no, no that, that, that's, that's different. Here, here we're talking about how, uh, how the, the process of the black hole getting more and more entangled with the radiation somehow um, it causes causes this locality assumption to break down. No, but even, even no, but at early times, it seems like it's it's uh, it's uh, it's okay to assume. No, 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 no. The, the full fine grain entropy of the radiation. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. So, not not in general. I, I agree. In general, it might be difficult, but in our model, there is. So let me let me let me let me talk about that. I, I didn't mean for it to be thin. Okay. So the idea. Is that so? This black hole is Hawking radiating into the bath. Right? So there's radiation coming out like this, entangled with that, and this guy entangled with that. And we can compute the entropy of the bath at a slice like this. This is a well defined thing. And also the entropy of the bath at, let's say, at late times or something. But I'm computing. But I'm computing the entropy of the bath region. No, 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 the bath region. You know, we had the discussion about whether the operators of the bath region commute with operators inside boundary conditions and all that. And you have to worry about gravitational corrections. So far, everything you said was true. What, so, what, what, do, what do you mean by gravitational corrections? Do you mean, um, so one question, for example, like quantum fluctuations of the dilaton, or? Uh, Yes, it can. I agree that it can, but um, but you need but you need to show that. I guess ultimately is is, is the statement. No, no, no. The question is, you could compute in the model the commutator or something outside itself. We're, we're talking about how that affects entropy. So I'm trying to compute the entropy of this region. Uh, what, what's what's the thing that you're going to do? I mean, what what effect will affect? What effect do you think will spoil this? The first question is, what is the definition of the entropy? So you have to have an operator. This is a CFT on flat space. I know how to define the entropy of a region. No, no, but the CFT is flat space is coupled to something that's gravitational. No, but no, but that's that's far away. That that that. No, that that. No, that, that, that how about this? How about this? I can I can replace. Although I'm jumping the gun, but I can replace the bulk theory here with some two SYK systems. Let's say, okay. So there's some quantum mechanical thing here and a quantum mechanical thing there. Micro, micro, micro causality is respected outside of the bulk. But do you argue for that by saying you're switching off gravity? No, even if you switch on gravity, that's also true. So this is quite a computation because you worry about the fact, for example, in, in the small world, it would not be true. You know, because things would, would propagate all the way outside. So, micro, in this thing, the flat space region and put some, some commutator band or something inside, that would not vanish. 
sure, but 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 that would be a problem if I'm computing the entropy of something in the in the bath and something a union something in the bulk. But I'm not doing that. I'm computing the entropy of a subregion which is entirely in the bath. So the idea that the bath and the bulk are separate first requires you to show that the community is zero. So it's a misleading idea because it looks like they're two different regions of space. But, um, um, I'm, I'm confused. Operators do not compute exactly. There is no sense in which you can define an entropy for one by tracing up the other. And in this example that you drew, this picture, the operators would not compute exactly. Bulk and boundary operators would not compute exactly. Ah, no, no, oh, oh, okay, okay. Um, um, I think I'm going to touch, touch, touch on that actually. So, this notion of just tracing out, I, th I think that's the problem here, of just tracing out the other region. I'm going to get to that later. Um, the, but the, the, the first step here is to, is to um, sort of redo Hawking's calculation, okay? Yes. Where you do imagine that the bulk is some fixed thing and you just trace over it. And, then, and that makes the fine grain entropy a totally ill defined, sensitive to all these things. No, 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 sorry, no, no. no. Sure, sure, but 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 uh, but if if you're working with some flat, uh, fixed uh, metric, then it is well defined in just just uh, it, it. The problem here is is not whether it's well defined for a fixed metric. It's who who gave you the right to fix that metric. I think I think that's that's the problem. But right now I'm doing what Hawking did, which is let me fix that metric and then define it in the usual way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. But, but we'll get we'll get we'll get back to uh, the case where you where metric is dynamical. Good, good. And um, very good. And so um, yeah. So let's compute the entropy of of. Uh, so this is some. Let me see. Do I have a thing with? Um, yeah. So here I'm computing the entropy of a region B which is the union of BL and BR, okay? So that's why I do it like this, sort of very close to the boundary. Um, let me give you two arguments for why the entropy of this, of uh, the union of BL, BR grows as a function of time. Um, in fact, for all time, as you evolve these two points to the future, the first argument is going to be schematic, just by sort of, sort of ray tracing, just uh, looking at where the Hawking modes go. And then I'll give you a more precise calculation. Um, okay, so the, so, you know, we have these Hawking pairs. This guy is entangled with this guy. And similarly, this guy is entangled with this guy. So as I evolve from this t equals zero slice to this late time, you capture one partner of, of the left and right moving Hawking modes. And then if you evolve even more, you capture more partners, okay? You keep, ca you keep catching these uh, Hawking modes, or the rate at which you capture these Hawking modes is controlled by the, um, by the temperature of the black hole. And since, since, the, since the temperature is constant for all time, you expect that the entropy growth will simply be linear in time, so Sb, will go as temperature times time times the central charge of the, of the theory that you have. It's just uh, so the, um, the, the amount of information carried by each mode. OK, so you, this is an eternal black hole. So it's been connected for all time. And I started with the hartle hawking state, where there's radiation coming in. Keep, uh, balancing the radiation coming out. So it's a static situation. There's a boost symmetry in this space time, in fact. So and, this is the entropy of the radiation back in what? Well, you're going to subtract what back in? For now, for now, uh, let's just think of it as the growth of entropy due to the Hawking radiation. And this is what the equation. Fine. Subtract, subtract out the temperature equals zero uh, answer. Okay, and it'll, it'll give you this, and you, you can see it explicitly as I'm going to show. Okay, so the, 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 
left foot was the right foot. So the left foot was with the putting in and getting in from them, and the right foot was with the coming into the system. Okay. So I'm wondering about you know, why. You think why, why don't they balance each other? Okay, so we, we can, we, uh, if I draw a more careful picture, we'll, we'll, see that, we'll see that they don't actually balance each other. So I think the thing that you're noting is, um, is the following thing. Say, so so it, it's kind of symmetric what's entangled with what. So a mode here would be entangled with a mode here. Okay, let's look at the left movers. Um, let me see, actually, is this what I wanted? Um, no, this is not what I wanted, one sec. Um, yeah, so this mode actually, so let, let's just study what this mode does. This is now some bell pair, let's say, in the bath. But now let me pro propagate it forwards in time. So this thing falls into the black hole. So now it's part of the black hole system. It's not in the bath anymore. But this guy continues to be in the bath. So this causes the entropy to increase. That was, good. That was my next thing I was going to do. OK, OK. Uh, OK, yeah, this is just a schematic thing. And really, if you, if you draw the space-time correctly as a square and everything, and just trace everything, you'll show that, uh, that you, you, the entropy never goes down. OK, the more calculation, the more careful thing to do is, is just using CFT techniques, um, uh, where we know that since we have the vacuum in the W coordinates, the entropy of this region is simply something like this, log W1 plus minus W2 plus W1 minus minus W2 minus divided by 4 epsilon 1 W, epsilon 2 W. So these are the cutoffs of the two ends. So the Ws here are this guy is W plus minus 1, and this guy is W plus minus 2. Um, so this is what the entropy is of, of the union of these two intervals and the W vacuum. Um, to comp but, but something we should do is we should we express everything in terms of the physical coordinates, which is Y. Um, so we want to... Excuse me, how do you calculate this? So this is just, this, this is uh, Cardi Calabresi, or even before them. This is just the entropy of an interval in the vacuum. Um, so we want to express everything in terms of this coordinates, the, the physical coordinates in the bath. And also, the cutoffs are something we need to keep track of, how they transform. So to get how the cutoff transforms, you need to relate the, the two metrics. So So these two coordinates are Why am I writing in terms of y? Yeah, I want to get the t dependence or the or the or the, the, the u dependence, I guess. Um, so this metric here, this is the, this defines the cutoff in in in, in y uh, squared. This is the epsilon w squared. We know what the coordinate transformation is between y and w, and this gives you how the cutoff transforms. Um, and the answer you get ultimately the following. You find that this thing is equal to c over 3 log cosh squared pi t times u over 4 pi squared t squared epsilon 1y epsilon 2y, which at late times is simply 4 pi over 3 c 
T U, uh, I guess, yeah, whatever. Um, plus terms that go as log of epsilon. Okay. So that's how you get this. And you can imagine subtracting out the zero temperature case. And, and these guys will be canceled out. Okay, so the, so now the, the, if we plot the entropy curves, in this case, we find that the entropy of the bath, which is like the uh, Hawking radiation, simply starts at some value and just increases uh, linearly uh, in time at that rate, and just continues to do so for all time. Um, we need to compare this to the, uh, the coarse grain entropy of the black hole. The black hole here is the, the left-right system. The coarse grain entropy there is simply given by the area of the horizon of the wormhole. So there are two horizons here, right, on, on, on either side. So the coarse grain entropy is going to be some constant because the, the area is constant. So the Bechstein Hawking, well, S coarse is equal to two times the Bechstein Hawking entropy, which is equal to two times the diluton at the horizon divided by 4g newton. And this is, I guess, S of radiation. Okay. So even this, even the eternal black hole has an overfilling problem, or, or it has an information paradox, um, in that the entanglement entropy exceeds the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And the, the time at which this happens here actually goes as beta S Bekenstein Hawking uh, divided by C. So if you ignore the C factor, this is exactly what you expect of, uh, of when the page time kicks in and for an evaporating black hole. It's the temperature, or it's just the Bekenstein Hawking entropy in units of the temperature. Um, or, sorry, temperature 1 over T times, uh, times the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Um, yeah, central charge of the, of, the, of the field theory, of the CFT living on this background. Right? No, 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 yeah, it's, it's, no, but there's, a, there's an S Bekenstein Hawking, which is huge. Gravity, yes, it's small. It could be small, for example. No. No, C doesn't have to be large. C only has to be large if you want to ignore sort of the, the fluctuations of gravity but uh, when computing entropy. But let, we, that, that's, that's, let's not talk about that. Um, here, the thing that absorbs all the information, uh, the thing that allows you to absorb, absorb the large amount of information from gravity is time. I'm building up a lot of entanglement over a long period of time. Oh, um, it, uh, good. So it does have more degrees of freedom in that there's a, there's a volume factor. And, it's, and also it's a quantum field theory, so it has an infinite number of uh, degrees of freedom at any point anyways. But really it's the volume factor you should have in mind. But it's the volume factor that would save you there. Yeah. Exactly. So here you imagine SYK with n degrees of freedom, but coupled to like a spin chain, where the number of degrees of freedom in any site is small, but you have a large volume factor. Um, yeah. So everything I said applies even for, for Schwarzschild black hole in the following sense. I mean, there, there we don't have this precise way of computing the entropy. But in, in the, the, the schematic arguments that applies, right? So we imagine we have some fixed background, and we, can, we consider a constant R slice, 
near the, near the black hole horizon. And you have Hawking radiation in the same way. And then you end up with a wormhole at late times. Uh, so, I mean, this wormhole grows. And at late times, it, 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 inside the wormhole, there's a lot of uh, Hawking, interior Hawking modes that are purified with the radiation outside. And really, the entropy of this region, assuming you have uh, you fixed up the background, is very large. So it 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 uh, it violates the uh, you know, for example, the Bekenstein bound. Although maybe maybe that maybe that's not really a problem. But um, that's right. That's right. Yeah, he pointed this out. So what was the first part of your question? The time. Yes. Uh, because it's one over genius time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so okay. So the point here is that um, okay. I had, I had some comments about why this is bad, and then I was going to jump into uh, Hayden Preskill and firewalls and so on and so forth. But given the time, maybe we should stop here. Thank you. Yes. So it's a string type of result, and it doesn't make sense. Correct. It's 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 um it's it's the information paradox. That's what this is. In this case, if you just take slices and make them go higher and higher, you see the volume of the maximum volume is nice goes up like a volume. Yeah. 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 No, okay. not in ADS. In ADS, it doesn't work. So let's, let's do it in ADS. Let's do it in ADS. Okay, so let's play in ADS and let's just take slices which keep going on. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. The volume is large, yes. but the entropy of the quantum fields here. Is, is, is small. It's small. Let me, let, me, let me explain. Let me explain. It's because of the, of the reflecting boundary conditions. So let's look at this mode, which was entangled with this mode. In our case, this, was, this escaped the black hole. But here, I mean, I, did, I actually didn't draw it properly. Uh, okay, it reflects back in. And so, and so they're both captured by the interior region. So the entropy doesn't actually keep growing. Yeah, that will be large. I agree. Really I, huge yeah, yeah, but that, that, that's different from saying that the von Neumann entropy is large. Yeah. 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 Possibly, possibly. Exactly, exactly.